Welcome to the Vegan Family Kitchen podcast and YouTube channel. My name is Brigitte Jem and I am your host around here. And I am very excited today to welcome an old friend onto the podcast. Please uh, join me in welcoming Amy Kakibiki. She is an online fitness coach and she helps busy women lose weight and gain confidence without spending hours in the gym. And I think that is certainly something that will resonate with many, many people in my audience. Um, we don't ordinarily talk about weight loss in the vegan family kitchen. It's not a topic that I've gotten much into, but I know it is of interest to many. So let's let's talk about it today. And uh, hello, Amy. Hello. <laughs> Good to have you Thank today. you for having me. This is awesome. Yeah, it's wonderful to, to see you here. I haven't seen you in person in a few years, um, although you're kind of local to me. But it's great that at least we have this opportunity to connect. It's awesome. Here. Thank you so much for having me. It's sweet. And I would like to start just with you telling me a little bit more about the work you are doing um, these days right now with uh, women doing personal training. Yeah, so I got certified last year. It's a passion of mine. I've been, you know, working out for years and wanted to pursue this as a career for many years and there was never a right time. So I decided just to get it done and got certified last year. I have a few in-person clients, which I love. Um, also doing, uh, having clients online, which I have found just as rewarding because you really have a chance to connect with them, which is awesome and really keep in touch with them on a daily basis as opposed to your in-person clients, which is once or twice a week. So it's seeing people have confidence in themselves and regardless of size or shape is amazing and more rewarding than anything I've have done before. That is fantastic. I really love that. And we're going to talk a little bit more about your fitness journey and how you go about personal training in a few moments. But let's just backtrack a little bit and yeah. um, talk about your vegan and plant based journey. You've been vegan for f seven years now? Is yes, right? seven years. Yes. yes. And uh, we've been about on the same trajectory in that sense. And I'd love mm -hmm. to hear your story, because you also have a very interesting family background, which makes this story a little spicier. Yeah, so I was born and raised in Ireland. I was raised on meat and potatoes. Uh, there was no options, a few vegetables that were always overcooked. <laughs> and I moved to Canada after I finished university and met my husband. And I started watching some documentaries. My sister actually had told me to watch a certain documentary. I think it was Forks Over Knives. And and I went vegetarian that day. And I knew at some point in my life I would go vegan. I just didn't know when. And I think truth be told, I was just scared because having to change everything is very scary when you're in a routine and you're comfortable. And it was a very close friend who got married and her wedding, her and her husband were vegan and they had a full vegan wedding, all the guests, all oh, vegan nice. food. And it was at that point where I thought, okay, I'm at a wedding, I'm really enjoying this food, what's holding me back? There's, why not just do it? So I did, and the funny part of the story is my husband was the cook. He did 90% of the cooking, always has. And when I told him I was going vegan, it was a bit of a shock to his system because he was not there yet. He was not ready to do that. He wasn't vegetarian. And so it was a challenge for him to have to make this food with ingredients we weren't used to. And we decided then, it was about a year after that I had been vegan, he was doing some research, uh, more research than I had done, because for me it was ethics. It was all about how the animals were treated. And I had never thought of that before. It was not something that was ever brought up when I was growing up. I had no idea where the food came from. It just arrived on the plate. And I vividly mm -hmm. remember I was 28 and I was standing, I think, at Save On Foods and I was looking for chicken for dinner. And I stood at the um, at the counter and I saw this chicken and I remember thinking, how did it get here? And I have no idea what prompted that thought in my head. I just thought, how does it get from the grass, the farm, whatever, on here in the store? And when I started looking at the process that was involved, it was like, once you know the information, you can't unknow it. So it's a matter of... Do you act on it or do you just let it sit there? So we acted on it. And so it took my husband a few years. I didn't push him. He was the one that did his own research, wanted to find out more and wanted to live 
a, a life of not harming other animals just for the sake of 15 minutes of enjoyment of eating a food. It just didn't sit right with us. So we have two girls, they're nearly 10 and seven, and they're both vegan. We are raising a vegan family. And it's definitely, it's a lot, it's harder when they're going to school because you have birthday parties and other kids that bring food that you just don't eat anymore. So it's been Mm -hmm. a learning curve, but I think being open with them and telling them why we're doing this and being honest with them, like tell them this is where the food comes from. This is what we have to do in order to get that food. And that's the reason we're not eating it because we don't want to hurt the animals and not to mention the environmental impact that it has. It's undeniable. So we're trying to do the small bit that we can to help. That is so wonderful and so powerful. Um, I'm curious about how the cooking worked out because I'm obsessed about cooking. Yes. How the cooking worked out in those first couple of years when you had decided to be fully vegan, but your husband was not there yet. It was interesting. There was definitely some (laughs) days where I would eat beans and rice for every meal and he would have his on the side, whatever he was cooking on the side. Um, But then once we got some cookbooks and cookbooks that we really enjoyed reading and were easy, we basically took three or four recipes that we would use on a weekly basis and we'd switch them into our, the food we were having before. So then we had our basic three or four recipes that we would go to and we really enjoyed. And from there, it just grew into, you know, exploring more. And what we didn't realize is there are so many more options for vegetables, for lentils, grains, everything that you're just not exposed to on the Western diet. So that has made a huge difference in not only how we feel, but also when people come over for dinner, they really enjoy the food because it's food they haven't had before, which makes it more fun. Absolutely. And it's so uh, strange how people think of veganism as a restrictive diet, but in fact, I've Mm -hmm. never eaten so many different things as I've eaten in the last seven years. Yes. Um, and, and, uh, there's this, and all those things should also be eaten by omnivores, omnivores, you know, yeah. that's what they should be eating. They should be eating a variety of vegetables. Um, but Definitely. I don't know if it's just easier to fall in a rut uh, when mm-hmm. most of your calories come from animals. It's oh, a bit of a mystery. A hundred percent. And it's funny going back to, I don't think I answered your original question was what happened with cooking. So now it's transformed I do probably 90% of the cooking. Oh, really? I didn't know. Yes. And it's because I enjoy it more. Like I enjoy trying new things. And it's, it started off as a process of I have to do it because he, he, my husband is awesome. And he definitely embraced the lifestyle that I was choosing to go. Um, But then when I looked at it from a perspective of let's just try something new, let's have fun let's see what happens when I add this and this together, or let's look at the recipe, but don't follow it completely. Let's uh, take this out or add this. And it just became more fun, which I really enjoyed. It wasn't just, oh, I've got to make dinner. It's what can I add? Like, let's go in the pantry and see what I can add to this and this and see what happens. That's a very important mindset mindset shift. I think Mm -hmm. a lot of people think of themselves as either not liking cooking or not being good at it or usually both together and once you move into this uh, childlike discovery mode i it makes a world of difference totally true totally true and um that's fascinating i love it okay so tell me tell me a little bit more uh then about your fitness journey because that's the other part um Mm -hmm. that's important for us today yeah so growing up in ireland I'm one of three kids. My mom was a single mom. She worked three jobs. There was no time to have us go to activities when we were younger. We did our uh, sports that was in high school, but nothing outside of high school. There was no, I wasn't into sports. I didn't, I didn't want to walk anywhere, let alone do any other physical activity. So when I moved to Canada after university, um, my husband and I decided to move into the city and we didn't know anybody. He is from um, BC, but he also, he didn't have many friends in the city. So I decided I'm going to join some kind of team sport. Let's just put it out there. Let's get uncomfortable and let's see (laughs) what happens. (laughs) Why not? So I joined a field hockey team and that's where my love of exercise really bloomed. There were some girls that I was playing hockey with and one of them had asked, hey, who wants to do a triathlon? 
And we're like, there's no way. There's no, yeah, you might. <laughs> but back then, there was no way. And she said, let's just start small. So we decided to do some sprint triathlons. And it's true what they say that you can get. It's addictive. Like that feeling of pushing yourself through something. <clears throat> excuse me. And then afterwards, it's incredible. So that started, that must be 13 years ago. And then I had my first daughter and realized training for a triathlon just wasn't sustainable when you have little kids. So I decided to try different types of activity to see what would fit into my lifestyle and then incorporate that, which was great. And then I had, we had our second daughter and it sort of evolved from there as to how I could incorporate fitness into my busy lifestyle with having a full-time job, having two kids, a husband, you've got a house, you know, all these things to look after and to take care of. But how do I make fitness part of my journey that will help me with self-care and help me look after myself so I can then be better for those around me? Yes. Putting ourselves mm -hmm. first is actually kind of a good thing. And it's very hard. Um, yes. You know, one thing I find when we talk about, um, especially when I talk with parents, but mostly moms who struggle with children who are mm -hmm. highly selective, a.k.a. picky eaters. Yes. Um, and, you know, we talk endlessly about, you know, you know, they like this, but they don't like that. And they like, you know, all the white things, but none of the vegetables. And then I say, but what do you want to eat? And they're like, what? I don't know. That's a great <laughs> question. And in the same way, I think we need to remember, you know, what do you like to do? How do you like to feel? Mm -hmm. And just because you've had kids doesn't mean that you need to just dissolve yourself yes. into that. Um, because if you don't fill your bucket, then you don't have anything to give to others. That's so true. Very, uh, very important to remember. Mm -hmm. Something that strikes me um, when you mentioned, you know, you were not athletic growing up. And I certainly was not either. I started... Um, running basically out of peer pressure <laughs> because yes. I lived on campus and everybody was running and being in BC there was nothing else to do on yep. Sunday morning <laughs> so you go for a run right and that's how I got started too um, but I'm curious to know if it's something that you talk about with your clients as well this kind of shift it might be more specific to women about mm -hmm. how as young girls and teenagers we're often not so inclined to do sporty yeah. things and yeah. what does it take to transition our mindset into you know what this is actually great um, I think having a conversation if I had someone say to me in high school this is what the benefits are this is why you should do it this is the long-term um, benefits of working out moving your body I think I would have taken it more seriously but I just looked on it as oh I, ha I have to do it I don't want to do it I don't want to do it if you have you tell me I have to do something I don't want to do it but if you tell me the reasons why I should do it or what could happen from doing it I'll listen so I think if I had I had someone and one of my goals with starting my um, coaching business is to be able to develop some kind of program that I could bring into high schools to get teenagers uh, from 13 to 18, get them into a gym, get them comfortable in their body, get them lifting weights and get them moving and in a way that is sustainable throughout their whole life, not just for, you know, the hour they're with me or whatever the case may be, but something that they can carry with them and teach, show to their kids and their families or whatever the case may be. But it's, I think, having the conversation and being open-minded enough to talk about it because nobody, when they're young, young, you generally see boys who are in the gym who are you know 15 16 17 18 lifting heavy weights and that can be really intimidating for younger girls and women especially they think you go into a gym and well if i'm not lifting that i can't be in here which is totally not true so i want to help them get in there and feel confident and be able to lift whatever they want to lift or try exercises they've never had before and feel good when they're doing it Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think I'm like, yes, yes, the benefits, you know, that's really important. But at the end of the day, I think finding it fun. Yes. Might also be critical. And you, you mentioned your um, your experience moving to BC and getting into team sports. I can think of like eight other things I would have probably done <laughs> myself, you know, because I really yes. don't really enjoy team sports, but I yep. really enjoy going by myself and seeing the city. Mm -hmm. So for me, cycling and running were 
your ways thing, yes. to kind of create my map of the city. But I, I think if it's not fun, then it's not sustainable. If it's not something you enjoy, 100%. And you're not and going to stick with it. Like you said, with when you were running uh, on Sunday mornings, you did it because everyone else did it. You're lucky that you developed the enjoyment for it. But a lot of people will do something because their peers are doing it because they think they have to. When in actual fact, do something that you enjoy, which will make you want to do it more and more. And like you said, it's more sustainable. Yes, 100%. Um, so what's so different about uh, being plant-based and active um, after having children, especially when the kids are still interested in us, let's put it that way, because I don't know, uh, I'm, ex I'm counting the years now, maybe the months um, for which my daughter is still interested in hanging out with me. She's 10, uh, like yours. Um, but so in those years when our kids really want us, uh, they don't just want to connect with us yeah. once in a while, but they really want us there. What's, how does that impact, um, especially fitness, but perhaps also um, the kind of food that we eat? Yeah, getting them involved. So the girls will know on Sunday mornings is when, on the weekends when I'm home with them, Sunday mornings is my time to, I have half an hour, I do a workout on Sunday mornings. And most often they're up with me. And they're doing it beside me. The youngest one loves burpees. I do not, but she does. So Isn't it's kind of weird. Them? Yes. Yeah. My yes. daughter's the same. You say the word burpee and she starts doing burpees. And I was like, what is wrong with you? Exactly. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? And I think when you're shorter, it's probably it's something easier. Like that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So getting them involved and saying, come join me. And having they observe and they absorb so much of what you're doing without you knowing. So bringing them in the kitchen and asking them, what do you feel like eating for dinner tonight? So we at every Sunday night, we'll say, what do we want for dinner this week? We each pick a meal of what we want and then we'll make it. Mostly we'll try and make it together, but there are times where it's just too busy. Um, but also, yeah, keeping them with you, get them involved, tell them why you're doing it. And you'll be surprised at their reaction. More often than not, they'll want to participate, which is really cool. I love that. What are the kinds of struggles that you see uh, your your clients especially experiencing when they're in that stage of life um, mm -hmm. where we're at i guess that's a great question um especially when you have you know you have kids you've got a full-time job you're busy the hardest thing there's three actually the hardest first would be expectations so you put such high expectations on yourself but you don't put those expectations on other people so give yourself a break start small go slow if you go mm. too hard too fast it is not going to be sustainable and you're going to get really demotivated when you don't achieve those goals that you're setting out for yourself so start small expectations are huge another how thing is, small give me an example of how an small. example would be if you're non-active you're pretty much sedentary you go to work sit at your desk come home sit home sit at home start with trying to get 20 minutes of walking three times a week if you can do that you created a habit do it for a few weeks then you know those 20 minutes three times a week you're walking and you'll feel so much better and then you build upon that and then you think okay well i'm going to do 10 minutes of walking and then i'm going to do 10 minutes of lifting some weights oh, and then you go it. from yeah. there so don't have these long big expectations of I'm going to go to the gym for an hour and a half and then you're going to walk into the gym and you're going to say well I don't know what to do so I'm just going to walk on the treadmill for an hour and a half so boring so start <laughs> yes. small that's huge the next thing is time so people think that that kind of flows in from the previous one but people think you need to spend hours in the gym when in actuality if you can do five times a week 30 minutes a time of exercise of strength training of resistance training you can see huge improvements massive if you have not been doing it in previously so you don't need to spend hours you just go in with a plan you need to have a plan or you're going to get stressed out and you're not going to go back i and totally hear you on that yeah the next one is comparing yourself this is really really hard and it's taken a long time for me to not do this and it's constant work constant mindset work but don't compare yourself with somebody else's journey everybody starts somewhere and even if you have a friend who's starting the same time as you there's things that will happen in each of your lives and you cannot compare your two journeys because your goals may be different to somebody else's goals so it's super important to think about what you want and what your goals are and go from there 
And I mean, your bodies will be different too. I mean, we all come from a different place and we're on different trajectories. Yes, definitely. In, in connection to that, um, Mm -hmm. we, you, we've mentioned weight loss at the beginning. Mm -hmm. How big of a driver is it for, um, the fitness component, um, and what kind of tips would you have to give to people about that topic specifically? You know, we're bombarded in the social media space with having to look a certain way in order to go to the gym or in order to be a trainer, an online, a trainer, personal trainer, in person, whatever it is. And it's very sad to see people, they do not want to go to a gym or work out because they don't look that way. When in reality, I have friends who are 110 pounds and struggle walking up the stairs because they have zero cardiovascular capabilities. But I also have friends who are overweight and they're lifting heavier weights than I am. And they're able to do workouts, you know, lift stronger weights, have better cardio than I do. So you can't compare someone's size to how fit they are which is very hard for people to grasp that concept when all we see all day every day is very toned, very muscular bodies on social media because it's it's really not reality for most of us. It's just not true. Right. And do you have any suggestions for ridding oneself of that or to move away from those odd expectations? Yeah, I think it's being kind to yourself. Like you, you're in the body you're in. Think of everything that your body has gone through over the last many, many years. Be grateful. And then say, what can you do to help you move forward? Is that drinking three liters of water a day? If it is, try it for a week and see what happens. Is that having two more portions of vegetables on your plate? Try it and see what happens. But be kind to yourself. Give yourself gratitude and say, yes, you can do it. You're, maybe you're not at the ideal size that you want. But what can you do? What small things can you implement that are going to make a difference long term? And not not just in a number on the scale. Exactly. Um, but also in how you feel and how yes. much energy you have and how aligned you feel with your your values, beliefs and your 100%. values and your ethics, right? It's huge. And I realized once we adopted a vegan lifestyle, it was almost like a weight like once I knew how food was processed and how it got to us, that sat in my shoulders for a long time. And then once I actually committed to being vegan and going plant-based, it was almost like I could breathe. It was like, oh yeah, now I am really living the values that I truly believe in. And you know, I have family who don't believe in the way I eat, which is totally fine. But I know that I am being true to how I feel and how I want to live my life, which feels amazing. It does. Um, It really, once you have that alignment, and often people ask me about the connection between diet and Mm. mental health. And I think there is, I mean, there's obviously some links that we're increasingly understanding about the gut microbiome and the gut brain connection and all that stuff, which is fascinating. But I think there's also a moral component to it where Mm -hmm. um, if you can live without animals suffering, why would you not? And once you rid yourself of that little niggly yes. thought at the back of your mind. It feels just so It liberating. really does. And it's amazing the amount of people I meet that will say, oh, I feel so bad, but it's only, you know, it's only chicken. It doesn't matter. It's only chicken. Like, but you know, you already know how it feels. It, fe- it doesn't feel good in your heart, but it's just acting on it. So people either choose to act on it or they choose to not listen. Well, everybody will get there eventually, yes. I hope. And I hope uh, so. I, chickpeas are yes. way better <laughs> than chicken in so many ways. So it's, it's worth trying. Yeah. Tell me a little bit before we wrap up. Tell me a little bit about what happens uh, when someone starts working with you. How, how do you work with your clients um, 
online yeah. and perhaps differently in person. Yeah, so I take on just a few in-person clients um, and then the rest are online. And so it's, we set up, we have consultations to figure out what are, what are your goals? What is really important to you? And then we, I design a program with them and figure out, depending on what their time constraints are. And then we have weekly check-ins that would be via team or Zooms, uh, to connect once a week. And then we would connect sort of text messages or through um, our training program daily, every second day to find out what's working, what's not. And what's really cool with online training is you get a chance to connect with your clients more than you would in person. In person, you might see them once or twice a week, which is great. But online, you have the capability to connect with them on a daily basis and find out what are their struggles, you know, how was their day to day, how was your water intake? And they could say, oh, I really struggled. And then you try and come up with alternatives, how they can get in their water or whatever their issue is. So I feel I'm a lot more connected with my uh, online clients than I am in person, which when I first started training, it was a to I thought it was the total opposite. Right. So it was a very cool um, way to look at it. You have your finger on the pulse, I guess, more. A hundred percent. And I think once way. you c keep connected with your clients, they are, you kind of open up the conversation because naturally you have some barriers up when you first meet somebody, but it's trying to create an environment that is safe and to know that your trainer is there to help you. It's not for them. We want to help you achieve whatever goals you want to do. Yes. And the funny thing in general, I think there's been a number of studies on that where people tend to be um, also more open and to share more of their secrets yes. um, with a stranger that they will never see in real life. And yes. I think there's a little bit of that that creates a tighter bond and in kind of a online coaching almost. relationships. Yes. Right. They're not going yeah. to bump into you at the grocery store. Or no. <laughs> anything like that um, yes it's, it's true it's funny how we are like that um so let give let's let's uh, wrap this up with one um tip one thing that you would like everyone who's listening to this when mm -hmm. they're done listening or at the same time as we're finishing what would you like them to do start just start it doesn't matter where you are in your journey just start so whether it's walking, whether it's trying to do squats, whether it's, you know, taking the stairs instead of taking the elevator, just start. Don't wait for Monday. Don't wait. Just start. I love it. That is fantastic. How can people connect with you, Amy? So I'm on Instagram and my handle is plantstrong underscore AK. And then Facebook, you can find me by my first and last name, Amy Kakabiki. Feel free to reach out anytime. That is fantastic. I just love your Instagram stories and your posts. It's Thank very you. inspiring and uplifting. And you're very open about the uh, interesting and sometimes challenging things and yes. thoughts that may cross your mind. And I, mm -hmm. I just love the energy that you're sharing. So I, Thank you. I will definitely put all that in the show notes and people can click the links at the bottom in the YouTube channel. I love channel. it. Thank you so much, Amy, for being with me today. It's a treasure to have you in the community here. And I look forward to connecting again, perhaps here Thank in the you. Vegan Family Kitchen or somewhere else. It was wonderful. I really, really loved this. Thank you so much. Thank you.